Jesse Mueller, you're spending some time again with Seth Rudetsky as part of his concert series. But before we get into that, we are having this conversation just a few days after Cynthia Weil passed away. Um, and I'm wondering what, if any, interaction you had with her during Beautiful and what memories you might have of any experiences with her. Um, well, yes, I'm trying to remember the first time I met Barry and Cynthia. You know, now that you say that, I think Barry and Cynthia might have been at one of my one of my last auditions, I think, because I think they sat in on some of the auditions for folks. Car Carol was they were taping for Carol um, because uh, those folks had um, because of the life rights that were involved in the show. They had they had some some um, casting. What am I trying to say? Not confirmation. What's the term? Ca the term casting approval, I guess so I think so I didn't really meet them then but that was probably my first interaction with them without even knowing it um and then I would have met them San Francisco I guess when we did the show out of town in San Francisco that might have been the first time um I know Anika Larson who played Cynthia in the show and Jared Spector who played Barry Mann they had a lot of interaction with them sort of a little bit as the show was forming and certainly throughout the years and um yeah um Anika's going to head out there to be part of a celebration of Cynthia's life that's happening and um been talking to her a lot the whole cast in the, over the last couple of days I think everybody's pretty was pretty shocked and and um saddened and just thinking about the family and sending our condolences and um she was just such a she was such a powerhouse she was such a such a powerhouse and such a cool, fun lady. And it's so fun to because like I said, Anika had more interaction with her than I did. But just to hear Anika talk about her in the last few days and um and it was just and for Anika, because she's a friend of mine, so much happened for her, Anika personally, because of that show and the opportunity to play Cynthia. Um it's like she met her husband on that show, she had her kids right after that and he was one of our dressers that introduced her to her husband. So she's very, she's just been feeling a lot of gratitude as well as the sadness over the passing of just the things that for her personally, this woman's life opened up for her that she never would have expected. As it did for a friend of mine who was Anika's replacement because Jessica Keenan Wynn is a friend of mine. Oh my gosh. And, yeah. And she came in and played Cynthia afterwards. Yeah. After Anika left. So it's Absolutely. a small world, isn't it, Jesse? I know. I know. I know. So when you were playing Lady Mortimer yes. in, in Henry IV, a character that doesn't have any printed lines, a character that only sings in Welsh that nobody can understand, right. what, were your, what were your thoughts 17 years ago about what your career might be from that moment? And how much does your career look like what you expected or hoped it might be? That was 17 years ago. I'm still stuck on that. <laughs> So I was only four. I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's incredible. Um, God, no, that really got me. That is wild. 17 years. I mean, my, that is so fun that you brought that up. My experience of that show, I remember because, so I got to do it at Chicago Shakespeare Theater in Chicago, and then we got to do it at the RSC in Stratford-upon-Avon. We were part of, a, they were doing a festival of the whole entire canon. And our show was chosen to represent the Henry Fours. Um, and I got to, so it was like kind of like a co-pro. So I got to go to England with the cast and we were performing at the RSC and there was the the River Avon and the, the river, yeah, isn't it the River Avon? And the, the swans are floating. Around. I mean, it was just, it was like a magical experience. And for me personally, I remember feeling like really feeling like I, I was starting to be treated like a real, like a real actor, like, oh, an adult actor. Cause there were some folks in the cast that I knew because my parents are actors in Chicago. So I had seen them doing shows growing up, but I felt like everyone was treating me like a peer. Like I wasn't the little kid of the kid of the actors friends or whatever. I, that was really, I remember that really being a moment for me about thinking maybe I'm really doing this. Like maybe, but I, as far as what was in my mind of where my career might go, no, nowhere near what has occurred. I, I don't think I could have imagined it. I didn't, I don't think I had that kind of scope. My model had sort of been 
um, a, a career in Chicago, which is what I was after. I wanted to be a working actor. And, um, you know, sometimes life takes you in different directions and it certainly did for me, but, um, yeah. Well, it's tough to assume that as an eight-year-old, you would be having career thoughts since you were eight, 17 since years. I was only, since I was only eight. <laughs> but some eight-year-olds have big dreams, you know, and they uh, do. no, I love that you came out with that question. That was brilliant. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Well, it's tough when you do these things because you've been asked so many things. So it's like, I try to hopefully have a couple where I hit some bullseyes that are unexpected. I don't I know that they it. all will be, but we'll see. No, I love it. It's so fun. Um, so I know that Into the Woods has been has been at least published as as your favorite Sondheim show. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. And I know you've played Cinderella in that. You played Mary Flynn in Merrily We Roll Along and Anne yes. Eggerman in A Little Night Music. Gosh, that's uh, right. I've done three Sondheim shows. Mm-hmm. You've done three Sondheim shows, but yeah. you have yet to do one on Broadway. Given that yeah, Into the Given that Into the Woods was just on Broadway, it's unlikely that opportunity will present itself anytime right. in the near future. So is there another Sondheim show that you would like to do on Broadway? Oh, wow. I feel like the music from Passion was going through my head the other day, but honestly, that's not a show I, I know super well. Um, um, yeah, maybe I'll have to like wait till Woods rolls around again. Maybe I could, maybe I could witch this time around or something. I could do the, I, I don't know. Or just like a couple, right? And then I could come in as Jack's mother. That's the thing about that show. You could just sort of cycle through all the roles. Um, I don't know. It's very ironic. But Sweeney, talk- and Sweeney is happening now. That's one I'd like right. to do, I think, at some point is Mrs. Right. Love it. Um, it's, it's, I have to say, Jesse, it's very ironic that you brought up passion because this morning as I was driving into my office, I was thinking, how weird would it be if Jesse answers that question with passion? Maybe something's in the like I have not I have I haven't thought this through people but I again it's not a show I know well I've seen it once, um, but isn't that isn't that that loving you is not a choice it's who I am that's isn't exactly that the song I was thinking of that was the that is wild okay and maybe I was thinking of it because I was just at the Signature Theater in D.C. Cheetah Rivera was receiving the Sondheim Award there, and then they um, very graciously gave us some swag when we left and it. And it was a shirt that says loving Sondheim is not a choice. It's who I am. So I'm sure that's why it was in my head, but it's weird that it was, it's been in your psyche as well. Well, I hope that when you, when you, you know, do your shows with Seth, that somehow, you know, that gets pulled out, you know, and, and. <laughs> I'd have to prepare for that one. I'm sure he probably knows it by heart. He'd be like, oh yes. And I'd be like, ah, I got to come. And then he would like school me on the Sondheim rhythm. He'd be like, you're not singing it correctly. The, the nice in thing, a loving way, in a loving he, way, he would tell me. The nice thing is Sondheim isn't here to 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 know whether you did that or not. He'd know. I think he'd know. He would. He would. Yeah, he would know. He would. Um, so your career, for the most part, is, as in terms of musicals, has been revivals, reimaginings of shows, and obviously Beautiful, which, you know, is, is, is a jukebox musical. Mm-hmm. But in terms of new musicals, I feel like your association with that from my experience has been with recordings because you have the recording of my heart says go that's out right now. And I understand you're, you're, I don't know if the recording's finished for diary of a wimpy kid. Not yet. It's in, it's in there in their editing process now. Yeah. Right. So what do these recordings tell us about what your passion is for doing new work in addition to doing the work you've done already? I've always, yeah, I've always had a, like a soft spot in my heart for new stuff just because I guess I find it it's so exciting. I mean, it also can be uh, infuriating when you're working on it, like in the room, but it's funny because you were talking about, yes, it it was like beautiful was, it was a jukebox. So you had the music, right? was already written. And that was, we knew that was golden, but like working on something like Waitress was so exciting because it was, it was a story that had been conceived, of course, from the film by Adrian Shelley, but the music was original, so it had never been staged before. So it was an adaption, but, um, and and that, I don't know, there's just something, there's something exciting about being, being in that incubator, being in the process of trying to figure out what's working, what might not be working. But that's also the, the part that can be infuriating is you don't know so we do, do we trust what we've got? Have we just not cracked it yet? Or is it that we've tried everything and maybe it needs a tweak in the writing or the stage? Like, but I, 
I, I do. I find that stuff. It's just exciting to me, I guess, also because um, depending on who you're working with, and I've gotten to work with very generous people that are that are very open to what you bring to it. So there is that there's that openness about bringing yourself and your perspective. And yeah, I, I think it's a real it's a real privilege to originate a role and and you know sort of put put your put your stamp on it yeah I know from my own theater memories anytime I get to, you know because I'm born and raised in Los Angeles so when Chicago came to Los Angeles and I'm talking back before you were born um because I'm old AF you know I was I was I got to see Cheetah Rivera and I got to see Gwen Verdon and it meant so much to me to see the originators of the role not to take anything away from anybody who did it afterwards but I have to assume that it's equally exciting to be that originator. Yeah. Well, that's funny you bring that up because I'm reading Cheetah's book right now. She just came out with a memoir. Have you read it yet? Not yet. It's it, I'm only like 100 pages in because I just started it, but it's so fun. And it's funny because I've been thinking about that because that was definitely that was a time when when the stars would go out on the road with shows. You know, I, I don't know if it, it just yeah there was that i think there was that pride in i don't know what it is but i think there was there was a pride in yes i originated this show and then i'm gonna go on the road with it and um yeah and i think that doesn't that doesn't happen as much anymore i don't know if it's because people are you know we're kind of bopping to new projects right away we're on to the next i'm not sure what it is but yeah there's something really special about seeing something a part of the inception of it knowing that that was it was sort of crafted on and around that person. There's not like a game of, like an artistic game of telephone that was going on about getting things um, communicated through different channels. And, but that's also the beauty of a great piece is that different people can, can interpret it. And it still, it still has its, its impact and maybe a different impact because a different person is bringing their own soul to it. But yeah, I mean, seeing something like that would have just been incredible. Yeah, and you mentioned the new production, the revival of Sweeney Todd, which I can't wait to yeah. see next time I'm in New York. But I am lucky that I had the experience of seeing Angela Lansbury in Los Angeles as Mrs. Lovett. I mean, come on. It doesn't get better than that. No, no. I don't think I, uh, I don't think I ever got to see her live on stage, but I feel like I, I grew up watching her. I mean, in it was all in movies, but she's. Yeah, she's up there with like Julie Andrews for me, as far as like, yeah, yeah. It's just there's we don't have a lot of those those dames left. We do not. We do not. Since most people associate you with musicals because you have this amazing musical talent and anybody who saw in person or clips or on, you know, anywhere clips of Carousel knows how truly magnificent your voice is. But yeah. You also got to do a Tracy Letts play um, with the minutes. And I happen to be a huge fan of his writing. But is it a challenge for you to be seen as somebody who can act as well as somebody who can sing? In terms of feeling like uh, 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 that that's the perception from the outside that like, oh, hey, I can act too, like that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously it takes acting to pull off any role in a musical, but I think people enter into it from the perception of music first, acting second. Not the mm. talent, but the people who watch a given performance. Maybe. Right, because maybe that's the... Yeah, that seems to be the, I don't know, the sparklier thing, maybe? Or the more... The, it, it's... it's um. Well, you yeah, come out singing the songs, you think about how they're sung. You don't necessarily sure. that you don't necessarily most a lot of audience members I would guess don't necessarily think oh but that was also a great acting performance they don't right, that was acted so well right because you're supposed to make it look easy it's not but I think I think the the people that I admire the most too the singers I admire like to me there's a difference between singing and like singing there's a difference between someone who can sing and has a great instrument which is amazing but someone who's also a communicator. Um, and then you have those people who have both, who have the glorious instrument and the communication tool. Um, I feel like Hugh Jackman says it a lot. It's it's the idea of like, 
it's almost in some ways it's almost harder to act in a musical sometimes because you have to make it seem believable that you're breaking into song and you and you have these very heightened um experiences which is why the characters are breaking into song it's too it's too much to just say it one has to sing it um but yeah i think i think actors especially musical theater act or actors who appear in musicals don't get the credence sometimes they deserve for the acting that that they're doing um because also people are asked to do so much and they're asked to dance and they're asked to sing and they're asked to um as a musical change their clothes a lot and wear fancy shoes you know um there's a lot going on so it does make sense that people sometimes pick out the like wow they had such a high note but hopefully yeah i've always been one who i think i actually do go to the acting first which is funny when i'm working on something when I'm learning something, or as you as you spoke of earlier, working on something new, a new piece, I have to remind myself, like, Jess, you, you can't act it yet. You don't know it. You have to learn it. You have to do the technical stuff first of learning it, and then you can do the acting work because then it's in your body. Then it's, it can get in your bones. Then you can really get inside of it to, to deliver and then go back and fix the technical things and all of that again and kind of go back and forth between those processes. Well, it's interesting. I spoke to Billy Porter a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody knows him so much for his performances on Pose that he feels like he has to reintroduce himself as a singer now that he's on a concert tour, which is insane to me. Isn't that wild? I was just having this conversation with Seth um, because somehow I came across the recording of Billy doing Beauty School Dropout. For some reason, I had never heard this from Greece. I did not remember that, like, Seth was playing in the pit for that show. He was like, oh, yeah. I mean, and the first, I guess the first time I saw Billy was in Kinky Boots. But I mean, that, I say this a lot, like that idiot's voice is just, but he's one of those people too, has an extraordinary instrument, but there is meaning behind it. There is, there is guts behind it. There is soul behind it. There is he's not just doing stuff and ornamenting for ornament's sake like he's a he's a communicator but isn't that isn't that fascinating i think it just you know we're human beings we have a lot going on so we like to categorize it put things in files it just makes things we have to like we have to keep making things smaller otherwise it just gets too big so we put people in these categories but yeah people like billy porter it's like no he can he can do it all. But yeah, isn't that funny that now he's like, oh, yeah, I, I, I also sing. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Now, since you hey, remember this. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I also saw him in Shuffle Along. I saw him, you know, sure. I saw him. Yeah. I saw him in, in Angels in America. I mean, what can't he do? Right. Exactly. Now, since you mentioned your your good pal, Seth Rudetsky, yeah. one of the things I love most about your collaboration with Seth is the social impact component of it. Oh, that you did this, what the world needs now for the Pulse, after the Pulse shooting in Orlando, that you were involved with him with the Concerts for America. What do you feel is 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 your role as an artist in helping to bring about social impact and social change? Well, if I'm going to be honest, I'm still figuring that out, but, and coming to terms with the idea that I might have a platform that people might be listening to. So um, if that is the case, I might as well use it for good. And I and I think I'm starting to crystallize this idea more. I really appreciate people like Seth and his husband, James Wesley, because they are doers. I I feel like I'm a helper. I like I like to help. I, I like to be of service, but I'm not necessarily the first person who's going to say. I will lead the charge. I, I, I'm kind of like, what can I do to help? Who needs a sandwich? You know, who can I call? Who can I, I, I feel like I get in there once, once they start to like, yeah, lead the charge. And then, and then I try to come in and, and do my thing and do what I can to help. But I, I, I am uh, sort of beholden to, to, to people like them who take those first initial steps, I would say. Yeah. Well, let's talk about a gap in steps then, um, sure. because it's not often that an that an, an actor gets to revisit a role. And eleven years ago was when you first stepped into the shoes of Miss Adelaide, 
um, yeah, yeah. In, a, in a production of Guys and Dolls. And then you got to do it again, you know, at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. How did how did your professional and life experiences inform who Miss Adelaide is more recently than who she was when you performed that role 11 years ago? Gosh, that's so interesting. I don't know if I got into quite the... I feel like I should have a better answer to this question. Be like, well, of course, this time around. But it's funny because the process is so quick for the Broadway series at the Kennedy Center. So I think, in all honesty, I was relying a lot on like, what do I remember? Like, what is in my muscle memory of who this gal is? Um, but sure, I mean, you. I don't think I can help but like, I'm older now. I have more life experience. I, I been in the business for a while. I've been an entertainer for a while. Miss Adelaide has been an entertainer. She's been a headliner at the hot box and she takes her pride in that. And, um, and half the fun too is getting in the room with all the new people. And then you go, oh, right, right, right. This is how this changes this. And this is who this Adelaide is because of James being my Nathan and all this, all this stuff. So that's half the fun of it. But um, it was, it was just kind of a joy to re to revisit it. I wasn't sure I would ever get the chance to revisit it again. And honestly, I felt like I was a little young the first time, but I was like, I'm game. Let's, let's do it. Let's try it. And it was my buddy, Matt Raftery, who was directing that production in Chicago. And I remember I went in for Sarah initially, and then he was like, would you like to take a stab at Adelaide? Like, would you go look at the sides and come back in? I was like, sure. I just always kind of wanted to be the character actress with, you know, the fun costumes and the big, the big funny songs. So yeah, I loved I loved doing it again. But yeah, it did feel different too. It felt different. It would have to. It would have to. Yeah, yeah. Now, even though you did it 11 years ago, it's been 14 years since Guys and Dolls has been on Broadway. So you know what the math nice. says, you know what the math says about that. It Just, it could it could be time for a revival. It could be time. Well, they're, they're doing and they're doing the big show in London right now. Right, Nick Heitner's production. Right, because there was a lot of I heard there was a lot of chitta chatta. There was a lot of after we did it in in DC, and we were so glad that it was so well received. And um, Pippa and Steve and James and I, we were like, I mean, we were totally game. We we're like, yeah, let's we would explore this. Um, but right, the rights were tied up in the in Heitner's production in London. So, which I've heard incredible things about, and has just been so well received. So, so I don't know. I don't know what would happen. I don't know if they'd bring that over here. Um, I know that it, it might be a challenge just because of the space and how they're with their um, immersive, I was supposed to say interactive production, no immersive production, which seems so cool. Um, I don't know, but if the opportunity came around again, I would, I would totally float that idea, especially if I could do it with those, with those three. Um, yeah, we just had a ball, we had a ball. Well, if they can adjust a theater to make Here Lies Love work, that's uh, true. Why couldn't they do Guys and Dolls? Yeah, but maybe all the Brits will want to come. Or maybe Actors, Actors Equity will say, you know what? We can't you, have you can that many. It, but, you, but you can you can do it with an American cast. Then you'd have to send a bunch of America. Isn't it? I, I feel like with Equity, it is sort of like an exchange. It's almost a direct exchange. It's like, oh, you get three of them. We get three of you. Like that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know. That could be wrong. That's what I remember from years ago. Right. So I'm going to take you back in time one more time. Okay. How far this will be this will be nine years ago. Okay. You did an interview with Patrick Healy of the New York Times just after winning the Tony Award for Beautiful. God, what did I say? And you said, "I thought I'd get wrapped up in all the wrong things of your move to New York from Chicago." And you continued to say, "And now look what's happened. It feels like a wonderful accident." And I love that expression, "wonderful accident." Nine years later, what does your career still feel like a wonderful accident? Is there perhaps something more complex going on? I think so. I think so. Um, I think I'm still learning how to, <laughs> I was just having a talk with a buddy about this. And this will sound like such a crunch. Like this is a hard business. It does. I don't think it matters how quote unquote successful you are, whatever the heck that means. It's hard on your heart. It's personal. Even when it's not personal, it's personal because the work is personal. You bring yourself, that's the job. You're supposed to feel and think and move and act and talk in front of strangers, sometimes as someone else, sometimes as yourself, and hopefully create an exchange of meaning and maybe memory and maybe a spiritual flow and all these things. And that is hard. That is hard. So I, I went on a tangent, but I think 
it's not it's not an accident and i'm working on owning my achievements and i'm proud of them but it's like the moment you hook into that and give that too much meaning you are very you are often very quickly reminded that like that doesn't it doesn't hold in a storm it's 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 still it's not the most important thing so to me to me it's this constant evaluation of what i put importance on and not diminishing something not diminishing an accomplishment or achievement or how hard i have worked but acknowledging that it's not the most important thing that i have had incredible opportunities in my mind god has been so good about where i've been led and who i've been led to and the opportunities that have been put in front of me but also i've worked my ass off with the gifts i've been given um so but yeah i think also at that time in my life i was i was really trying to figure out where i fit in the whole scheme of things i mean i still am what is what is humble what is self-deprecating what is where are those lines how do you stay um true to yourself and who you are and what you believe in but also um have the grace and humility to like just keep it real <laughs> i don't know i don't know well isn't ultimately the moral of the story that the wiggly worm can grow up to have a successful career and be happy yeah maybe still working i mean and it's not there's no and it's still it's still a journey i would be lying if i was like yeah i'm successful and happy all the time well nobody, nobody is nobody is. is nobody is but i think there's a lot of there's a lot of time and expense spent in this business to make it look that way because i understand that we're selling magic i do understand that but we're human beings who enact the magic. So we're not always magic all the time. Don't always, don't always feel so magic. Sometimes we feel a little wiggly like that worm. Yeah. And for people who don't know, that was apparently your first official stage appearance. I think it was my first role that I recall. So I was the wiggly worm in, in some, some school, probably a spring the spring festival production of something i don't know it was probably all of seven or eight years old yeah if i was a wiggly worm i thank the lord that i could squirm or something like this it, and that it was, was only as, as we know if it was eight years ago that was only 17 years 17 ago 17 years ago which you know so i remember it quite well um <laughs> yeah it was, in the, it was in the realm of like you know all god's children got a place in the choir like everybody's got their look how it all comes around so yes i'm still the worm trying to figure out where I fit in the circle of life. 